My name's Mark Bristow. I'm the president and CEO of Barrick. And uh, Barrick is a very interesting company. It, it, today's Barrick is a combination of a company I started, Rand Gold Resources, back in 1995 as a private company and built it into a North African-focused um, gold company, which was at one point the most profitable gold company in the world. And Barrick has great assets, and it fell on hard times after some excesses in, you know, it post the 2011 um, uh, super cycle in the commodity space and particularly gold. And and so in 19, uh, sorry, in 2015, I approached John Thornton, who was the chairman then, and said, you know, if we're going to fix this, if you'd like to fix this barrack, maybe we should talk to some people who've done it before. And so over a period of time, we had this very intellectual conversation about what is a, what is really the, makes the a world class gold mining company, and uh, and ultimately agreed to merge the two companies at market, so no premiums, and uh, and select the best people uh, to run the best assets to deliver. And if you do that, you ultimately should deliver the best performance and that was the thesis of the barrack of today so you so you're what you're trying to uh, create is best assets best people and therefore get the best results so if i'm just reading it back to you exactly okay and the, the merger was completed four and a half just over four and a half years ago second of january 2019 okay um so we're almost five years in um in this world of instant gratification and um, uh, people wanting results uh, immediately, uh, where are you on that process? Do you feel that you're you're there? Do you feel you're halfway there? You know, how long does it take to turn a super tanker around? I think we're we're there. And if you look back, just to add a bit of colour in this, it wasn't just a merger of Rand Gold and and Barrick. Uh, when at the merger, Barrick had. Uh, assets in Nevada and so did Newmont and these two companies had been talking for a very long time on how to merge their assets because vehicles used to big 300 ton trucks used to drive past uh, infrastructure to their own infrastructure to process the material and it was just an irrational uh, situation and for two decades or more, there had been ongoing conversations. So I approached uh, the then CEO of, of Newmont. We had some conversations. We're already in joint venture with them at uh, Turquoise Ridge. And, you know, there was some unreasonable suggestions. So as a response, I, I put the whole company, New, Newmont, and got everyone's attention. And the consequence was that of that was they sat down and worked out a way how we put the company and all the all the assets together. Today, that's called Nevada Gold Mines, biggest gold mining complex in the world, and it employs seven plus thousand people, and it produces about three and a half million ounces of gold on a hundred percent basis, and um, and. Uh, uh, Newmont's got thirty-eight percent, and and we've got eighty-two uh, percent. Uh, so, so you're sixteen, uh, sixty-one and a half percent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, and that's been that in itself was a merger of two very diverse cultures, and and then I came along and wanted to create a Rangel culture, a different, flatter. Uh, organization and uh, at the same time Barrick had struggled to make its African investments um, work and so it had African Barrick and then eventually it spun those assets and, t and they're all in Tanzania out uh, and formed Acacia and that wasn't a success and so I turned to uh, got, take private the Acacia assets in Tanzania and that was a difficult challenge as well because it was a 
comfortable management structure sitting in London. Anyway, we succeeded there and again, so we that merged that into into the new barracks. So quite diverse as you can imagine. And Barrick had a very large head office. It was centrally controlled. And my style is flatten the structure, move ownership to the operations, make the operations accountable uh, for their own businesses because we believe in in our managers acting like owners. And so and that and the, uh, to get that through, you've got to make the company more personable. It's got to care. We 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 focus on less expatriates and more uh, host country nationals. So in Nevada, we want Nevadans, and in uh, Congo, we want Congolese. And we prepare to invest in that. And it takes a bit of time to identify the skills and bring them through the organization. More more than uh, often, they are there, embedded. And there was certainly that was the case in in those two transactions. Do you um, uh, take people from um, different countries and cultures to train them up in different operations around the world? I mean, have you got kind of an internal kind of um, graduate, um, kind of an ongoing continual professional development program that involves cross-fertilization of operations? Absolutely. So in Kabali, when we built it, we did exactly that. And in fact, we took the the, the best of our construction workers during the construction and moved them to uh, two lots of 30 who were who sh- who had the aptitude to be able to operate via big trucks and to operate the processing plant. And we uh, uh, sent them to our mine in Ivory Coast and the mine in uh, Mali. And they worked there until they were able to actually operate, do the job themselves. And they then came back to K- Kabali in the Congo and were part of the commissioning team. And so that, and it's important, it's a good question because in all our minds around the world, our workers go home every night. So the community is very much part of our organization. Um, and we, wherever it is, um, in whatever country we, we operate. So, so far, you've described how you've brought the, the Rand Gold culture to, to Barrick. But now that your market capitalization is $29 billion, $30 billion, whatever it is, it's a, it's a big number. You're producing more than 4 million ounces of gold a year, plus around 200,000 tons of copper a year. You know, it's a very different, um, it's a different sized animal. It's a very different sized beast. Um, what's the, um, and what, for example, when you're driving a small vehicle, you, you drive differently to when you're driving a big vehicle, you know, you just change your behavior. Um, what is the cultural difference that you've had to learn and adapt to, to cope with the, or just to the bigger size vehicle and the bigger market capitalization and the bigger numbers? So it's interesting, you know, one of the criticisms when I, when we announced the, the, the proposed merger was could. I transport the Rangol culture into a global organization. And 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 the, the answer is yes, because the way I did it, first of all, is today in the corporate office, we have 48 people. A uh, quarter of what we we had when I arrived. And, um, and today they do a lot more work. Uh, and we're a much bigger organization, to your point. So a lot more efficient, younger, very, uh, some smart people. And again, we cross-pollinate all the time so that our corporate team is really communication, HR, strategy, uh, and analysis and consolidation of the financials. And so to, to get any of those done properly, you need to know what the organization looks like. That's the first point. Second one is I broke Barrick up into three Rand Golds. North America, uh, Central, South, and Asia Pacific. So Central and South America, Asia Pacific, and then Africa, Middle East. And each one of those regions has a chief operating officer and a full team underneath them like I have. Same, almost identical in position. And they run that organization on a day-to-day basis. And so we effectively are like shareholders. And 
we visit, I visit every mine, every quarter and spend time with the operations. So, so it's a, it's, it, and that's what made Rand Gold was, it was a dynamic, agile, engaged, owner, owner style organization. And, and again, we don't own the ore bodies here on the corporate. We audit them, but we don't own them. The ownership sits on the mine. So the, so you can't have this traditional general manager in our organization. You've got to have business people. You've got to have the ability to manage environments, the social situation, the communications, you know, press, politics, all that sort of stuff. And and as I'm sure you I would appreciate, you know, you have to manage politics in, in the United States every day. And we are the biggest miner in the U- U.S. through this massive complex we operate. And, and, and at the same time, you've got to be able to be right on your toes in Bali, for instance, which is also extremely dynamic. So that's the way we run it. And, and for me, my, 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 I, I, the things that haven't changed is that I understand the business and I know all the people. The, what's changed is that my, my position is a lot more strategic and I go to where the challenges are. And so I'm able to bring a much broader skill base to deal with challenges when they occur and, and then mining, you know, you wake up to a challenge and then for good measure, you have a few more in the afternoon. That's the name of the game. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've, I've worked in the Congo and you're there as well. And, um, there's a phrase I've heard, which is there's never a dull day in the Congo, but, um, it's, it's, there's never a dull day in mining, you know, right across the board, whether you're operating in North America, South America, wherever. Um, I, I do see that there's a, there's a gap in the geography. Uh, which is Australia. You know, that's a, it's a it's a proper mining culture. There's a lot of uh, drill meters that get um, put into the ground every year, so the discovery rate is high. Um, is that something that you can look to fill, or would that just be too many mines for you to visit in a quarter? No, no. Um, you know, the point, the quality, the, the 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 to answer your second point first is. You need to stick to high quality assets. So the other thing we did when we merged is sold sold the non core assets, um, and so we we and you've got to keep trimming and growing your business through bigger, better, uh, you know, higher quality assets. Um, Australia, we when I took over, we we owned fifty percent of the super pit along with Newmont. Um, it wasn't working, and uh, and we weren't the managers, and and in fact, I I so I sold it, um, and and Barrick at at the time I got involved was in a, as I said in my intro, was under pressure, and so it it was withdrawing from everywhere, almost, and 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 I think conceptually looking to be, uh, in Nevada, but Nevada wasn't sustainable as it in, in that current form so and and australia is always a challenge for foreign investments investors generally it's a very efficient market very capable mining skills exploration skills um and very highly priced so you know i've owned uh, assets in australia through my career and um and so absolutely we'll go back there but we'd have to go back there on on the on the back of something of quality, and and right now um, that's a, a, a you no know, to set up in in Australia's is not appropriate at the moment. But could there be a time? Sure. More importantly, I've built I built Rand Gold by importing Australians into Africa to train the Africans, and so we have a very Australian-centric uh, culture when it comes to mining, particularly mining underground and open cost. When, uh, you know, and when it comes to geology, I mean, most of our geology thinking comes from the UK, actually. And our geology group is 
stationed out of London uh, because it's you know in the middle of the world and um, it's easy to get to anywhere. Um, and so it's and so we've tried to choose the you know the best of of the best. And you know if you want to go into copper processing, you need to understand and and have ties into South America. Um, uh, but you know, Australia too has been a pioneer in some of the new technology in milling, for instance, and flotation, etc. So, so we, you know, as far as um, how we do our business, we're 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 very much involved, and our P and G mine is supported through Aus this Australian infrastructure. Um, so you know, whilst we don't have specific operations there, we d we certainly need to use it. Okay, thank you. That's 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 really that's really interesting. Um, just since we're talking about kind of um, skills around the world, uh, exploration. You know, that was always the lifeblood of 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 Rand Gold. Um, and I can see in your quarterly presentation and also in the presentation from the, from the beginning of the year that you talk about your ongoing brownfields exploration. Um, you've got uh, about nineteen years. Uh, of reserves, you've got whatever it is, 76 million ounces in reserve and producing just over 4.2 million ounces on an annual basis. Um, do you see the greatest um, opportunity through brownfields exploration? And um, and the other flip side to that is, does that mean that you're unlikely to be active in the uh, in, in the market buying? companies that come through you know is it's is, is it a is it um more likely to be that you generate your own resource growth so and if you look back to the second february uh 2019 we've since then consumed uh 16.5 million ounces in production and we have replaced it all uh so uh and 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 when we got to to barry it didn't have a mineral resource management sort of psychology. The geologists were almost parked on a, you know, it was like a decoration on the wall. Oh, we've got some exploration. Sure, we've got some geologists. Um, and what I worked at is integrating that skill base into the organization uh, across the group and, and gave geologists a key claim to the management structure of every mine and and the mine owns its both brownfields and greenfields exploration strategy under the guidance of the corporate exploration growth team and and to do that you know geologists good geologists are hard to find because uh the industry has never replaced what it's about as a whole, I mean, we're unique in that form. So yes, we, and we are, you know, I'm looking now to incentivize our senior management on the, on a three year rolling replacement because otherwise you exploit your asset and it looks good for a while, but you end up with crises like both Barrick and Newmont found themselves in 2015. Uh, yeah, there were very strange times in the in the market um, uh, uh, then. And in fact, we're actually living through a bit of a, uh, a strange time in the market now. And perhaps a general question: you know, a lot of our audience is retail based. Um, you know, as a CEO of a gold producer, as a CEO of um, um, one of the two major gold producers in the world, um, why, sh um, if a retail investor says to you, "I want exposure to gold." What what do you offer, which is beyond, I don't know, an ETF or buying the index or um, or just buying the metal themselves? Why why should retail or um, family offices have a stake in a company like Barrick or Barrick specifically relative to other kinds of investment? So we it, when you own gold in 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 Barrick, you get of course the value of that gold. You also get a yield, which you don't do if you own gold in, in the bank or an ETF. And you, uh, as we've demonstrated uh, through my career, you'll get more gold because it, it multiplies as we build the size of the business. The key is 
uh, to build it without issuing more and more stock. And, you know, we did that really well in Rand Gold. Uh, we're at that point with, in Barrick on a much larger scale to be able to scale up. So, you know, one big, dis we need discoveries and, and we've just, uh, on, on this last uh, week's uh, quarterly, we explained and pointed to the fact that Barrick will grow on a gold equivalent production basis by 2029 by 25%. That means we're not going to buy it. We're going to deliver it but on the same uh, cap capital base that we have today uh, with uh, with an additional expansion in Lamana and, of course, a new mine in Pakistan. But we are building that. We're not paying premiums uh, for that quality. And Pakistan has got 40 years left and and everything looks like we're going to have 40 years of life in Lamana and um, and uh, Nevada will grow from about on a on a hundred percent basis uh, about 3.2 million uh, ounces to about 3.7 but in the same period so that's that's the the point that you get from and you know when you get into this and we had to do quite a bit of work to recapitalize the organization, which was selling assets to really um, keep alive. And, you know, when I took over, there was $4 billion of net debt. We we have no material debt anymore. We've got the strongest balance sheet in, in the industry. We've paid back significant returns to our shareholders through share buybacks, through uh, distribution of uh, capital and also dividends, and um, and and whilst we are not a, a dividend-focused organization, I've always said that if you set out to be profitable, you'll always generate more money than you can spend, um, and so you should share that with your shareholders, and that's the concept. And that, and we certainly have paid dividends from the day we put the two companies together. And um, just in terms of the, the, um, the shareholder, I mean, you've, you've spoken very clearly about the culture of the, the two businesses that you've brought to the operations. I wonder what about the, the, the culture of the, the shareholders? I mean, do you get uh, questions or pressure to, to focus on um, safe jurisdictions like North America? Um, and I mean, you, 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 can, you can get growth in North America and you can get growth in uh, high risk jurisdictions such as um, uh, Pakistan or, or some countries in Africa, uh, is, is there? Do you get pressure from any of your kind of North American shareholders to say, have you thought about splitting the business and actually having kind of a, a North American style business and a, the rest of the world business? So you know the, that's a, that's certainly something in the of the past. You know today, uh, running mining companies in North America has is as challenging in a different way as running companies in the developing world. Um, largely because there is a big contingent of anti-mining folk in, in, in the US and the regulatory and litigation uh, procedures around permitting an asset makes it a long haul. Um, and sometimes the you you can spend an enormous amount of money and then get um, uh, hijacked right at the last minute by that litigation. And a classic example is the revolution, the, the huge revolution uh, uh, copper deposit in uh, Arizona that's owned by BHP and um, and Rio. And so you know, so you've got to do and and again, just. You know, we've become very efficient in the way we operate in the United States because of our experience of operating in emerging and developing markets. Because we're a lot, we know again, this today, mining, you can't do remote control. Well, you can, but it's a slow process and it's very inefficient. But you've got to be part of the community. You know, people, people, you know, 
and I always say, we as mine is my national assets. And so you've got to make sure that you recognize that stakeholders need to benefit from that, whether it's the community or the national treasury, or in the case of USA, more state focused uh, returns. And you've got to you make sure that you embrace your broader stakeholder. And in fact, uh, today, I always say the the host country is probably a more important stakeholder than a shareholder. The shareholder is, of course, first in line on the benefits. But, you know, the, the, the host country often puts up a lot more risk or takes on a lot more risk in mining when somebody comes into the country and says, trust me, I'm a miner, I'm going to exploit your assets and show me how... I can do that. Um, so, you know, we are very much a, a future forward or future facing organization. And and to do that as well, you've you've got to embrace younger people and 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 since I've taken over at Barrick, we've we've uh, our age profile has reduced significantly because that's another thing. Mining has always been considered a, sort of an old style um, industry and it's not really you know and and today it's it you have to embrace all the aspects of modern life and you know different visions and appreciations of things like the environment and 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 social impacts yeah absolutely well uh, mark i've been um taking up a lot of your time. Thank you very much. It's, it's been a wide-ranging discussion, which I think has been incredibly helpful. Um, perhaps by way of uh, wrapping up, could you uh, kind of, let's say there's, we've got some um, viewers who are sitting on the fence who are not sure what to look for in kind of Rand Gold's delivery, I keep saying it, in, in, in terms of barracks delivery over the next uh, six to eight months. What are you, what um, targets would you like to kind of tick off uh, so that uh, any waverers might be convinced over the, the kind of the, the the next six months or so. What are you aiming to deliver? So, I think we today we have all the key assets we need. Uh, number one, we've definitely got amongst the best people in the industry, and number two, we've definitely got the majority of the tier one assets. Uh, in in the gold industry and the two big copper projects that we're developing are absolutely tier one. So um, we've got those two important ingredients to deliver the value creation that uh, that I promised back in 2019, which we will do. And we've already done that in that we've got the strongest balance sheet in the business. We... we um, we don't have any material debt. We have constantly paid dividends. And uh, and so when I look at, uh, and Nevada is now fixed, and that's a massive organization, and it's set for 15 years and beyond. And again, that's a good uh, point, is that all these assets are, uh, uh, life of mines are beyond 10 years and based on a long-term $1,300 gold price. So that really builds in a margin. And so for, for me, if you want uh, to have some of your investments in a place which is immune from being printed like paper money or uh, risked in a bank, owning the, the barrack stock is the next best thing to own owning a bar of gold and and for me uh, my I've done this many times in my career is to prove to our investors that actually it's better than owning a bar of gold for just the reasons you and I discussed before we started this interview and that is that we grow that bar of gold and we pay rent for back you know interest rates back to our shareholders and so that's really what what you buy when you buy barrack apart from i would finish we do really good things across the world um 
and we develop the underdeveloped countries as part of our business. And this will to survive uh, doesn't need all the cars in California to have batteries. It needs the development of those economies that have been left behind so that they too can participate in a cl cleaner, better, more profitable future. Mark, on that note, I couldn't agree more with um, particularly your concluding remarks about um, uh, the benefits of development of primary industries in emerging economies. Um, we could talk about that for weeks, but I think just for now, um, thank you very much and I'll, I'll let you get on with your day. Thanks to see you again.